fortunate to have Ryan. He's the uh, vice chairman and board of Visby. And Ryan is the Lightfield Evangelist. I had that title one time. He's a camera hacker and an immersive geek. And he's written and spoken extensively about VR and holographic capture. Mostly when he's not wiring together cameras and shooting light fields for Visby, he's doing something else. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, bye. Anthony. You know, they call you an evangelist, but you don't actually know how to do anything else. Um, thanks for the introduction. Simpty, thanks for showing up. Um, and Ariane, thanks for roping me into IDEA and all those lovely conference calls. Uh, you play your cards right, you can join those conference calls. That's the soft pitch for IDEA. Um, I'm going to try to lay out a little bit of theory around light fields um, and proper clicker management. You just got to push the right button, it turns out. Uh, OK, so uh, I think there's a lot of misinformation and confusion around what exactly constitutes a light field. So I'm going to do my best to provide a framework that will hopefully clear it up a little bit, or at least uh, contribute to the confusion in a way that advances my own agenda. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the kind of the theory of light fields, um, and then look a little bit at live action capture, but more from a theoretical standpoint. Like, how does it happen, uh, but why does it work or not? Um, and then I'll make another soft pitch for the standards body. Um, so as a framing, point here, I really think that light fields and light field displays are really interesting because they represent a, a massive platform shift, not a small one, right? The, the sort of platform shifts we get when you go from, uh, say, radio to cinema to television, right? This is a fundamental change. It's going to be a huge shift, and it's going to really matter to anyone creating content, uh, but it also means that a lot of things will change dramatically. Um, the promise is really great. I think we've all been sold on the idea of something like a holodeck or, you know, a princess lay in your living room, watching sporting events on your, on your coffee table. Um, and having a different experience, a different relationship to the content. That is really exciting. Um, it's also really, frankly, not where we are right now. Um, and the main reason I think we're not there is there isn't really a reliable way to get the real world onto these holographic devices. Um, that's a big problem. If you can't get the real world onto a device, it's really nothing more than a video game peripheral. And I would argue that that's more or less what VR is today. Uh, how many people own VR headsets right now? And how many people do something other than watch, play video games on them? I'm impressed. This is a great audience. Um, I'm going to stop asking that question. But uh, <laughs> I still assert it's basically a video game environment. Because it turns out a lot of that live action content you watch was actually built with video game tools, right? I would say something like 95, 105% of stuff out there has all been done in video game engines. It's, it's overwhelmingly being done in Unity and Unreal. Um, and that's because the tools work, right? They're built for video games, so you can create content for VR and AR and so on using these tools. Um, but that's the de facto standard, and that's kind of a problem because these are not really built as standards technologies. There's some people trying to adapt them, but I think like a, a, maybe a ground up approach might work better. By the way, this is a great venue, but the goats here are enormous. Um, some of you may have seen some of this before. I'm just going to work up what I mean by a sort of a standard, a codec based, based standard. So in traditional 2D photography, uh, basically, we're just making a map of light rays. So you think of a 2D image, what that really is, every pixel in that image represents a light ray that was seen by the camera, which is an analog for how our, our eyes would see an image, right? And that's, that's kind of how 2D works. Um, so all of the work that goes uh, into 2D codecs is trying to take those 2D radiance maps and do things to them um, to make them you know, compressible or easily viewed. Um, and that's, that's great. Um, I can't even see these slides are so huge. <laughs> um, so for light fields, if we were to do that, we want to have a really similar technique, right? You would want to have a signal of interest. You would want to record it, um, compress it or manipulate it, and then be able to play it back. This seems fairly straightforward. To me, that's like the minimum threshold for a codec, right? Um, it turns out it's actually really hard, though, for holographic images, as Ariane alluded to. Um, primarily because, to, and this is where I work out what a light field actually is, so if you think of um, all of the light rays bouncing off of a scene and all possible viewer positions, um, you can imagine all the light rays connecting the two. And if you could actually capture those light rays on a surface and play them back, um, you wouldn't need your goat anymore. You'd have a, a hologram of the goat, right? Um, so ideally, that's where you build your codec. If you could capture the four-dimensional light field and play it back, you, you'd have the equivalent of a 2D video for, for holographic displays. That's really awesome. Um, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for a number of reasons. One, 2D images um, work on all sorts of different devices, right? You know ahead of time if it's going to be on a screen or on a phone or on a cinema that at least there's going to be a 2D raster I can work with, right? 
With these holographic displays, you don't necessarily have a raster ahead of time. Different devices will have different 4D rasterization. A VR headset, come with, someone could turn their head. You actually have to calculate things on the fly. So you don't actually have a, a consistent playback device. And then the other problem, this is where we get nerdy, um, your resolution scales up at end of the fourth, right? So instead of just resolution going up with n squared with 2D images, you've got these two other dimensions you have to deal with. And that generally puts these things out of reach of Moore's law. So we need something a little more sophisticated than just grabbing every possible light ray and playing it back. The other problem we have, honestly, is capture. So the good news is we can't even get those light rays. Um, <laughs> this image on the left here is from um, Lytro, rest <laughs> in peace. Um, at some point, I'm not going to have to keep saying that. Uh, that massive array of cameras was hideously undersampling a light field. You're capturing like some trivial fraction of the actual rays of light that are there on set. Um, and even at that, we're talking like terabytes per second. An uncompressed light field, you can do it back in the envelope for reasonable resolutions is like petabytes per second. So forget it. We're not building codecs around that. It ain't going to happen. The other problem we have is that beyond display fragmentation, there are dozens of different companies out there building lots of different things, different interface layers, and so on. We desperately need a standard that's going like, to kind of rope them all together. Um, otherwise, we're going to be in video game land forever. OK. So that's kind of the, the, the backdrop, I would say. The solution is really, I would say, the core of what IDEA is working on, is ways to represent um, light fields. I'm going to use that term expansively for a moment, but lots of ways of representing holographic content. Um, so uh, the basic premise is we can't have our petabytes per second light field at all. But we can do clever things with smaller data sets, uh, slightly impoverished data sets, by trading off compute for bandwidth. Um, you're not really playing back some of you captured for real then at that point. You are necessarily making up some light rays. That's the synthesis part of it. Um, and these approaches kind of boil down into three broad categories for me. Volumetric video, uh, ray tracing, and light fields. And they share a lot of DNA, so these are slightly artificial distinctions, but all of them are under the idea of umbrella. So for starters, volumetric video. This is essentially using video game technology, um, but repurposing it for live action content. You've probably seen some experiences done this way. Um, the premises you have, usually an array of cameras, um, oftentimes supplemented with something else, structured light or LiDAR scans. But the output is always going to be uh, a depth model, a polygons or point clouds. And that's the actual representation you're conveying. And so the way that the, uh, the images get created or the synthetic light rays get calculated is you cast a ray onto the object and you look at the color of that spot on the object and you return that to the viewer. So now you can have free perspective. You can walk around. You can populate a full raster of a light field display just by using the derived rays that you computed from that relatively small data set. Um, there's a couple of downsides. One, not everything looks good in a polygon. Um, the one that's notably really tough is hair. Like how many polygons do you have to have to get a strand of hair? It's, it's really, really tough. Um, and then the other one is view-dependent lighting effects. So it's a big part of light fields. As you move around, you expect the scenery to change, but not just with parallax. You expect to see reflections and specularity change as well. Um, if that doesn't happen, things don't look quite right. They frankly look like a video game. So to me, this is kind of the, the state of the art right now. This is practical. This exists. And there's some beautiful work being done with it. But I think it's a little transitional. I think we're going to get some more sophisticated technology in the, in the fairly near future. Um, the next step up will be ray tracing. Um, and this is an extension of video game technology, right? But the premise here is you've got a very high fidelity model. And you don't just cast rays against a polygon and return some value. You actually cast the ray against it and let it bounce around a bit and do some calculations. So it's a much more sophisticated calculation model. And this is within reach of Moore's law. I'm going to give some dedicated circuitry about that. Um, there's a Q&A later. I'm sure you can ask Jules about it. I'm totally freelancing here. I actually don't know anything about this subject matter. But we're starting to see some realistic things happen there. Um, the third category, and this slide looks better because this comes out of my company's deck, um, is around light fields. And so the premise here is, Let's capture as many light rays as we can, make that the primary data set, and try to record and play that back. Um, this is my personal favorite, but that's just because I'm working on it. Um, the nice thing about it is it's a little bit more like a 2D image in that you record a signal, and then you just try to play that back. Um, it's, it's real in the sense that you're not requiring a very necessarily um, uh, like a video game type engine to do your calculating for you. Um, and there's not an underlying model necessarily. And there's a big asterisk there that I'll, I'll get to later. But this is sort of the, in my mind, where a lot of live action capture is likely to go if we can manage to achieve the things we say we're going to. So a little breakdown here. Volumetric to me is kind of video games. I see ray tracing coming out of like the high end VFX. You know, as you see how good computer generated imagery can be done in a non real time context for you know, high end films these days. We'll get that kind of experience on displays in real time in the future. 
Uh, so I see those coming out of the, the VFX industry. And then for me, light fields are an extension of 2D video, the generalization of 2D video to 4D, although with significant complications. Okay, so let's talk about how people are actually capturing stuff. Um, I mentioned before, volumetric ray tracing, light field, camera arrays, something far more sophisticated if you want to capture ray traceable live action content. Again, this is kind of Jules' department. And then light fields is what we're working on at Visby. So for volumetric content, you have an array of cameras. You usually use computer vision, maybe use structured light, get your shape. There's your data stream, right? And that works, by the way. There's uh, probably a dozen companies working on this all over the map. You can get live streaming volumetric video today. It kind of looks and behaves like a mature technology. I still assert it's, it's uh, transitional, though. Um, for live action capture for ray tracing, this is much more challenging. I think you're seeing people that are actually digitally modeling things. You know, you get digital artists create the model. But there is live action capture via very large arrays of cameras and strobe lights and so on. And the idea there is if you want to ray trace a model, you don't just need to know the shape. You need to know how that model is going to behave under different lighting circumstances. So you have to actually back your way into some sort of lighting model. If you have that model, ray tracing can be very effective. So I expect we're going to start to see some sophisticated work being done in this department. Um, this can be cheap in the future, right, Jules? Like everyone's going to have it? Yeah. So, perfect. There you go. Yeah. And end of presentation. Um, the third category is light fields. So this is the area I know a little bit more about. Um, the premise is you just throw a lot of cameras at the problem. On set, it can look a little bit like a volumetric capture, but with like twice as many cameras or more. And again, you're not really concerned with the underlying polygon model or depths or so on. You're really just trying to throw lots and lots and lots of light rays at the problem. So I said before, there's kind of no model, and that's nice. It seems a little more real. You don't have to have like a, a strong prior about the subject matter. You're not going in there with digital artists. Um, that's actually a total lie. There's, there's definitely a model there. Um, so in practice, and I, I, I'm so excited to air this out here because it's empty. I can actually talk about these things. The problem with capturing a light field is uh, you're essentially applying a very coarse 2D comb filter to a rich four-dimensional signal. And there are all kinds of problems with that, um, as you can imagine, right? You're, you're throwing away most of the light in layman's terms. You're only capturing these little, little point samples. Any light that falls between cameras, you've completely lost. So that creates a bunch of problems. At the end of the day, it just makes for ugly images. Um, the ugliness can be softness. It can be edge doubling in extreme cases. Um, and it can be just all sorts of weird blobby artifacts. Um, I know I've got a whole hard drive full back in the office. Um, the good news is there is a way forward, and this is where the model really comes into play. Um, the problem arises when you need a light ray you didn't actually capture, which is frankly most of the time. So imagine you've got these point samples coming from your cameras. When you need a ray that fell between the cameras, what do you do? Well, you've got to interpolate it. And the way you interpolate it, <laughs> and we're going to go with a teapot now instead of goats. Um, you find the spot, you trace the ray down to the model to figure out what ray you, you care about. And you trace those rays back to your array of images. And you find the nearest rays that you actually have, and you just interpolate between them. And there's a whole lot of more sophistication, sophistication that goes on after that, but fundamentally that's the idea. And that's how you can get away with sampling, you know, 0.00001% of the actual light rays and get a really realistic image coming out the other side. And this is, you know, Pretty effective, actually, almost unreasonably effective. Um, it, it works to recover detail. You get view-dependent lighting effects, which is much harder to get in volumetric video. Um, it will not help you with certain things that you just simply didn't capture, right? So back to the aliasing idea. If there's high-frequency information there that's at a higher frequency than your camera spacing, you will not recover it. We can't actually beat the Nyquist limit in that regard. Um, but it does work. Now, when it's blown up this big, I'm sure it looks a little softer, but we have very legitimate photorealistic images coming out of uh, light field engines today. And there's actually great work being done at Google as well. Some of the highest quality images, <coughs> images you'll see in VR are light field images that have been put out by Google. So it is an effective technique. It is practical. Okay, it's not practical at all, but it's getting practical. It'll be more practical when it's a standard. So um, this is where I do that, that plea for standards. Um, there's a few problems we have here. Um, one, I personally would love to have a data blob that you can just send out into the world and it can just play back on any of these devices. In 2D video, that seems a lot more reasonable. In holographic video, it's a nightmare, right? I just, I, I, right now, I don't think you can really do it. Unity can do that. Unreal can do that. We need something that looks a little bit more like a codec that lets us publish to all those devices. Um, the good news is uh, we have a lot more tools at our disposal now than were present 20 years ago when people were trying to design 2D codecs. Um, the challenge of 4D light field or volumetric uh, content is 
massive bandwidth and or computation. The good news is we can leverage new developments in network architecture that allows us to distribute compute across the network. This isn't completely rolled out yet, but by the time this is a standard, it will be. So the right answer is it's gonna have to leverage the entire network really effectively. I mean, that's okay because frankly, we don't watch these images standing still, right? They're constantly being streamed, they're constantly being moved around. And if you can apply compute across a network to make these images easier to digest, easier to play back, that's gonna be a big deal. Um, I feel like I'm repeating myself here. We don't need to keep using video game tech though. If you take one talk away, one thing away from my talk, it's we need something new. It can't just be recycled video game tech. Probably looks like light fields. Um, and I'm happy to share this deck with anyone if they want afterwards. I think I'm gonna wrap it up here and just say, um, you all should join IDEA um, or talk to people about joining IDEA. Um, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>